Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, CVSL webinar uh, entitled Leading the Spaces Between Is Collaborative Leadership Inclusive Leadership? My name is James Reese. I'm the director of the Centre for Voluntary Sector Leadership here at the Open University Business School. And we're delighted to welcome today, in particular, our main speaker, Fosia Irfan from Bedfordshire and Luton Community Foundation. Uh, we're delighted that she could join us, um, and she's going to speak for about 20 minutes. First, I'm going to say a little bit more about the CVSL and some of the other speakers we have today. Um, so first of all, uh, the Centre for Voluntary Sector Leadership is a small research centre based at the Open University Business School. Our mission is to improve leadership in the voluntary sector, particularly focusing on smaller voluntary organisations through a virtuous cycle of research, free educational resources and a, a deep engagement with the sector at all levels. Um, I'm briefly going to say a little bit more about the thinking that we've been developing around leadership in the centre. Um, in particular, we've developed a focus uh, on non-traditional, uh, what, what is often called post-heroic models of leadership, with a focus on plural and collective forms. Um, we also focus on collaboration, and that's where the idea of collaborative leadership comes in. Um, and collaborative leadership is a focus of one of our free educational resources uh, which, to which we'll provide links later on in the webinar. Um, but we recognize that these terms can be quite confusing and often seem to overlap. So a theme of the discussion today is really exploring what we mean by collaborative leadership um, and indeed questioning whether we perhaps need to talk about it in different ways. Secondly, um, in a climate in which diversity is becoming ever more important, particularly in relation to leadership, um, following uh, uh, trends like Me Too and uh, the increasing focus on race and ethnicity, um, the, the, the issue of diversity and leadership is an ever more pressing issue. And we want to explore whether collaborative leadership is also a form of inclusive leadership. Um, and, and by inclusive, we mean that in the very widest sense. So as I said before, we're delighted to, to welcome Fosia Irfan, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Bedfordshire and Luton Community Foundation. She's been CEO since 2017, and before that she was a head of grant making. She is a governor of Luton Sixth Form College, and has a really wide range of uh, voluntary roles across the voluntary sector. Um, by background, she's actually a lawyer, um, and we look forward to hearing from her in a minute or two. Um, we were very much inspired to, to invite her following a, an interesting tweet, um, actually tweeted by Carl Wilding from NCBO. Um, and Carl pointed to the idea that um, leadership in our sector uh, is, is very much kind of showcased by what Fozzi is doing in her work, uh, not just leading her own organization, but also leading the spaces between. And this really chimes with uh, the work that we were doing in CVSL, um, understanding uh, more diverse forms of leadership, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, collective leadership and collaborative leadership. So before hearing from Fozia in a few minutes, I'm going to pass across to uh, my colleague, Carol Jacqueline Jarvis, who's a lecturer in management in CBSL and also in the business school. And she's going to uh, speak for about five minutes, um, introducing the idea of collaborative leadership, uh, what we mean by that, uh, and ho hopefully setting the context for, for Fozia to speak uh, in the main part of this, of, of this webinar. So if I can, I'll pass over to Carol. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, this Hi is Carol. Um, it's really nice to really have this nice opportunity to, to talk to you about a subject that subject is really important to me, both from my um, previous work in practice and um, also my research here at the Open University. Um, slide here with just a few headings about some of the themes of the, um, the topic of collaborative leadership, but just to, to take us back a little bit, I tend to think of the idea of collaborative leadership as originating with a book in the 1990s by authors Chris Lip and Larson. And that book focused on how leaders in local communities, and particularly politicians and public managers, needed to work in new, more cooperative, engaged ways with citizens to address issues in their communities. The book called for a new kind of leadership that acted across boundaries, boundaries of organisation, sector, profession and so forth recognising that the big challenges in society need the attention, ideas and actions that come from all parts of society with people acting together to make a difference. 
So then, so then this, this is very much the era, much the era that I think of in practice, the, um, the, um, partnership, the partnership era, era. And, that and that book spoke straight, straight directly, directly into that, that kind of practice. In, um, in um, the leadership literature, there's also a really important idea for thinking about collaborative leadership. And that's the idea that leadership can be thought of as a practice rather than a person or position. In simple terms, I guess we know this, but we so often talk in different ways, but in simple terms, leadership is about what people do, and when we think about collaborative leadership, it's about what people do together to set direction, to engage people, to move things on, to make things happen. So the academic literature develops the idea of collaborative leadership as a boundary-crossing practice that brings people together who have different, sometimes competing interests, and makes things happen that those people could not make happen by acting alone. Collaborative leadership engages with formal partnerships, the, the kind of structures, the um, working arrangements that many of us have acted within, but also very informal partnership collaborative arrangements. It not only works in those collaborative spaces, but creates new spaces for people to come together to make a difference and develop practices through which people act together to make things happen. That can sound that can really, sound really positive, positive, but many of us who have been in practice know the reality like isn't always that. like that. So the work of our so colleague, Professor Steve Bangan, 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 is amongst those point out that point out that the competing interests and goals of collaborating partners can pull partners apart or simply lead to inertia. So she and her co-author, Chris Hudson, argue that leading collaboratively involves engaging people, empowering them in the spirit of collaboration, but also more pragmatic activities to make things happen. They talk about politicking and manipulation behind the scenes. And Something that they call collaborative thuggery, which intriguingly brings together two ideas that don't seem to quite fit together at all, and yet um, resonate from many people's practice. In CBSL's online courses, we offer a definition of collaborative leadership. Hopefully you can see that on the screen now in the blue box. It's a definition we encourage learners to challenge and debate with us. It assumes that leadership is a practice we can all participate in. Leadership takes place at all levels of an organisation and indeed beyond the organisation. It's made to happen by the ways in which people interact relationally, formally and informally. This definition this definition recognises that collaborative leadership is political in the sense of working with diverse interests, not that everybody's interests come ideally together, even though they have overlapping goals. And the definition re-emphasises the point that the aim is for diverse groups of people to achieve something they can't achieve alone. It also highlights that it's in the process of debate between partners that issues are prioritised, understood differently and consequently moved in one direction or another. But we aren't suggesting this is the final definition. So log into the courses after you finish this webinar and engage with us in a discussion about whether this definition is one that resonates for you, whether you want to add to it or take away. Just going to close by commenting that I think there are at least three reasons why a collaborative approach to leadership is significant for the voluntary sector context. First, voluntary organisations structurally always have more than one person involved in leadership. So the idea of the, home, the lone heroic leader doesn't really quite work. Voluntary organisations are always governed by a number of people. And a volunteer board not only leads together with one another and with paid staff, but is also a mechanism for involving multiple stakeholders in leadership. So leadership of voluntary organisations should involve hearing multiple voices and finding finding ways to work together that takes account of those multiple voices. Secondly, collaborative leadership aligns, it seems to me, with the kind of values that voluntary organisations tend to associate themselves with, diversity and inclusion, citizen and user engagement, commitment to working together rather than um, with division. And thirdly, the issues that many voluntary organisations focus on involve working and leading across boundaries and sectors. So voluntary organisations, workers and volunteers are often engaged in leading responses to complex societal issues with others 
from different viewpoints and contexts. So it's essential to learn how to lead in a way that is not just about hierarchy and traditional authority, but to learn how we influence one another from those different perspectives and authorised by different ideas, so perhaps authorised by a relationship with users or citizens, or perhaps authorised by expert knowledge and experience rather than hierarchy. I'm hoping that somebody will now move to the next slide for me, because I don't have that in front of me. And, um, on that slide, hopefully you will see there's a number of references that you can follow up. Um, the book by Chris Huxton and Steve Bangan, Managing to Collaborate, has two really interesting chapters on leadership that you can read. There's also a book there by Crosby and Bryson, which is very relative, um, relevant to practice. And I've also provided um, a link to our CBSL working papers that you'll find on CBSL's website, where a number of us start to think about the existing literature on leadership and voluntary organizations and begin to offer a more collaborative and collective way of thinking. So thank you very much for listening to that. Really quick skim across some of the um, ideas that come across from the academic literature. I'm going to pass back to James, I think, now. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, that was an excellent overview of um, the recent thinking about collaborative leadership and I think gives us a really good context for, for the further, further discussion. Just to remind the audience that we should have plenty of time for questions after Fosia's uh, uh, sort of focus of the webinar today. Um, so without further ado, I will pass across to Fosia. Um, just a reminder that she's the Chief Executive Officer of Bedford and Lewis and Community Foundation. And she's going to speak to us today really about her practice and her uh, take on collaboration and particularly the idea of leading across, uh, across spaces in the voluntary sector. So, Fosia, over to you. Apologies, I think we're just having a slight technical problem with Sosia. You might, you don't think you will have heard what she was saying, um, but I think she's back on line now. Just so saying hi to James. Hi, hi James. I'm just going to check my microphone is actually working. You can hear me. I can, I can hear you. Yes, oh, you it can does hear seem me now. Brilliant. Sorry about this. We do have a few <laughs> technical teething problems. Over to you again, Fosia. Thank you, James. Um, what I was saying, and which nobody could hear, was uh, the fact that uh, collaborative leadership was actually quite a new concept to me. Um, and it's not something that I realized um, I was doing intentionally until it was pointed out. Um, and I think a lot of um, community organizations, a lot of charities do this type of work um, instinctively. It's something that um, over the years has developed into a way of working. Um, and most people don't pause or reflect uh, long enough to think about um, the way that they're working. But what the reason that I think it's developed and evolved and has become um, quite mainstream practice is because fundamentally um, collaborative leadership recognizes that we live in a world of complexity and interconnectedness. Um, so we are all part of one ecosystem and traditionally, uh, you know, you think of charities or voluntary sector organizations standing alone, delivering their services to their targeted community, et cetera. Um, but nowadays, um, and especially with the work that uh, Toby Lowe has carried out at Newcastle University, where he talks a lot about complexity. So we realize that we are all connected in a myriad of ways um, and we can't separate or extract ourselves from that complexity. And actually what we need to do is try to learn new ways of working within that complexity. Um, and sometimes the complexity of the systems that we work in can be quite overwhelming. So for example, our foundation um, recently um, thought about our strategic objectives and decided that we wanted to focus on poverty and inequality. 
two issues which are absolutely huge and could be overwhelming. But we realise that um, as a place-based funder, we have a specific role within this world of connections and we can bring something to the table, but we also need other people to be on that table as well with us. Um, so in our, in our foundation, what, we're, what this has meant is that we've shifted our vision and our mission to look more at where we sit in our community and what we can do as funders to leverage more than just grants. So as a grant maker, we give over a million pounds a year, in, mainly in small grants to small charities in the area. But as part of this review, we looked at what else could we do? What is our place in this system? To, um, and what else could we utilize? Um, what other tools do we have in our toolbox, which we can utilize um, to help be part of the solution? So um, a number of things, um, a number of new initiatives that we've taken on board all um, were centred in this belief that we're part of an ecosystem and, and we have a lot more to give within this community. One of the things that we have done is we recognise that small charities in particular suffer greatly in terms of lack of funding, in terms of voice in terms of being able to advocate um, and in terms of um, capacity building. Um, and we also recognise that there are lots of organisations which bring charities together, do training for charities, etc. But there weren't any specifically locally for small charities. Um, and we felt that it was very important for small charities to connect to come together, to learn from each other, to understand what they were all doing as part of our ecosystem within Bedfordshire. And although we do provide training and workshops, etc., the biggest, um, the, the sort of the most positive feedback we've received from from the small charities to take part in that forum, is that the coming together of them uh, of these charities in one space where they can interact with each other, they can network from, from each other, is actually um, you know, the most effective way of us leveraging our influence as a funder. Another thing that we um, did recently was we set up a funder's day. And again, this recognizes our role as a bridge between the national and the local. So as a place-based funder, we work mainly in Bedfordshire, um, and we pride ourselves on knowing almost every charity and community organisation who works in Bedfordshire and knowing what the needs are. However, uh, I also work with a lot of charitable foundations who work nationally um, and they felt that they did not know enough about specific areas to be able to fund well. So as a bridge between the national and the local, we extended or we set up this initiative to bring funders to Bedfordshire. And we literally took 12 um, funders on a minibus around Bedfordshire, uh, which was an interesting experience because, you know, if you think about a lot of national foundations, um, their staff tend to work in offices or um, tend to be based in London and just don't get the opportunities that we as a local place-based funder get to work in communities. So um, again, we thought about what our role was and what we could bring to the table. Um, and again, this is a piece of work which is not about using funds or giving grants, but is about evaluating what our role is and um, uh, the influence that we can bring in different ways. Um, we also recognise that bringing people to the table has to be part of a collaborative solution. So as one funder amongst probably 10 or 11 local funders and then countless national funders, we're unable on our own to solve the pro problems in our local area. Uh, it, it is, it, you know, it's not something that one organisation or one charity can do. Um, and so we recognise that we have to work collaboratively in order to reach these more effective solutions. And I think for funders, that's quite um, a big leap of faith to take because as funders and a lot of foundations we recognize the fact that we 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 are sort of almost indoctrinated into thinking that we will fund a project x and we will get an outcome y 
um, and we can show our impact. Um, but the reality, and I think Toby Lowe's work at the University of Newcastle demonstrates this, is that funders on their own or one organisation on its own is just unable physically um, to manage the amount of connections or to even um, say that one particular outcome was solely attributed to their work. Um, so recognising that we need to work in a different way, we need to recognise our place in the system and we need to work more collaboratively with others. There's a parallel uh, shift in, in perspective which needs to take place um, and that's about power. So normally um, within foundations power is distributed in a very hierarchical way and funders are in a place of immense power and privilege in terms of being able to um, give out grants and awards um, to smaller charity organisations. Collaborative working and collaborative leadership actually needs you to reevaluate as a foundation what your relationship with power is. And again, even if you're a, a charity delivering frontline services, again, you need to reevaluate what your, what your relationship with power is. Because collaborative power, uh, collaborative working requires a much more um, horizontal structure, a much more equitable way where power is shared equally across lots of different parties and organisations. And that um, model of sharing power um, equally is essential in order to reach solutions where you're co-producing and co-creating solutions for the community. And again, this uh, brings me back to the sort of traditional um, foundation model, which where you believe that expertise and funding decisions, grant making decisions should be made by a panel or a foundation executive. Um, the new way of working actually uh, makes you recognize that expertise lies within the communities that we serve and therefore co-production and co-creation is essential um, to solving many of the deep-seated issues that we have in, uh, in our communities. And without co-production and co-creation, uh, as a charity, you are just not going to have authentic engagement. Um, if you're perpetuating those power structures, if you're um, working within, within authoritarian models, then you cannot expect there to be genuine collaborative working. Um, Moving on to the particular role that funders and foundations have. Charities obviously provide frontline services and are extremely busy and challenged in terms of managing their day-to-day -day operations. As funders and foundations, I think it's in, we have three important um, roles that we need to play. Firstly, we can make the system more visible so that people can operate strategically. We're in a position of privilege where we, we do have uh, a greater strategic view of what's happening in a particular area. For example, in Bedfordshire, we carried out a, a, a community needs assessment where we looked across the whole of um, Bedfordshire, across three local authorities, to bring together an idea of what the key issues are um, and where the key needs were. At the Funders Day, um, we uh, managed to bring uh, together for the first time the three CEOs from each of the local authorities, and that hasn't happened for a very long time. And that brings me on to the second point, which is about stepping into the role of convener. So funders should rethink um, their role from just grant making to um, being a convener, being an influencer, bringing people to the table. And thirdly, um, the third thing which is incredibly important as part of this process is to create a collaborative, friendly culture. Um, and what that means is specifically recognising that there are barriers to collaboration. So, um, you know, there may be lots of very small charities who would love to collaborate with other charities or uh, larger organisations. But in order to do that, you need time, you need energy, you need resource. Um, all of, and all of those things are very scarce within um, particularly small charities. So funders need to think about what can they bring to the table which will enable a culture, a collaborative friendly culture to actually flourish. Um, 
and the key sort of um, attitudes and behaviors which are needed for a collaborative model to work are things like listening genuinely, flexibility, long-term thinking, and building relationships of trust. And these are all things which fund, funders and foundations are traditionally not very good at. Um, so uh, the, there is a sort of a, a period of self-reflection and self-awareness for funders and foundations as well as part of this uh, conversation. And then the, 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 the second thing that I wanted to touch upon, which um, uh, was already alluded to, was about inclusivity. Um, and making the making collaborative culture inclusive. Um, and again, collaborative uh, working and collaborative leadership recognizes, um, makes you recognize your place, but also the place of others. Um, and so to assume that there is an even playing field um, and that if you're willing to collaborate, everybody else should be willing to collaborate and they're in a position to do so, um, you know, that demonstrates a level of arrogance. Um, I'm a, a big advocate for an equity-based approach, which uh, is really approach, uh, an approach which is uh, prevalent in the US amongst foundations there which essentially is about looking at the position of the communities that you're working with and adapting your solutions to reach them. So it's not about a one-size-fits-all um, solution for everybody or universal fun funding programs, universal delivery of services. It's about a much more sophisticated way of looking at communities and saying, well, yes, we may want to have this collaborative model, but that assumes that everyone is able to step, step up to the table, uh, has the power and the resources to do so. Um, and as funders and foundations and anybody working within a collaborative model, you need to recognize that communities and organizations are at, at different places and actually a much more sophisticated way of working with communities using an equity approach um, is one that I would advocate. So in conclusion, what I really think is that space needs to be created at the table for collaboration, but we also need to recognize the barriers to getting to the table um, and recognize that actually we may need to move the table to reach the communities. So not assuming that communities will come to us um, in order to collaborate. And I think I will end there um, to leave some time for questions. Um, if anyone has any. Thank you so much, Posia. That was absolutely fascinating and um, definitely, I think, really deepened uh, the, the debate that we were previously having about collaborative leadership and, and takes us in some really interesting directions. I, re I, I definitely have questions coming in, um, although what I will do first is just pass over perhaps back to Carol, who I think might have a, a question uh, more directly to Fasia, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take some, some wider questions if that's okay. We have plenty of time. Um, we have about 20 minutes to take questions and, and certainly have some more interesting discussion with Fasia and perhaps with Carol as well. But I'll pass over to Carol first. Okay, thank you. Hope you can hear me okay, everyone, this time. I realized um, I was echoing somewhat last time I was speaking, so I hope that's working now. Um, Fozia, I was just really intrigued by you bringing power into the center of that discussion. That seems to me to be really so important. And um, you, you talked about working with power, but also that it's not always possible to equalize power. And I just wondered if you could unpack that a little bit for us when you're you're trying to shift the power relationship to work collaboratively. It's only possible to go so far. You know, how how do you deal with that? Um, well, I think uh, the first step in all of this discussion and conversation is um, to be self-aware. Um, there are an incredible number of funders and foundations who don't even acknowledge that they are in a position of privilege. Um, and um, don't realize that their relationships are built on a position of power and privilege. So the first step, especially for funders and foundations, is to be self-aware and self-critical and look at all our processes, our, um, the way that we, that we work, our operations, our relationships, to see where their, their, their privilege and power is being manifest in an unfair uh, way. 
Um, the work in the US um, that US foundations have done, um, I think is a great uh, starting point for this. So there are lots of tools and resources, and there's actually a movement called um, Power Move, uh, which is, uh, is an initiative set up by the National Council for Responsive Philanthropy in um, the US, and you, you can look up those details. But it's uh, that um, a whole list of resources and toolkits which enables an organization to look at its organization and recognize where there is power and those inbuilt barriers in terms of what it's doing in, in, in terms of delivery, but also internally. Um, and so that's the first point is to become self-aware, to become self-critical and to recognize where power resides. And then the, the second thing is to uh, use this equity approach to try and equalize, as you say, um, the the great the in dif uh, the differences between people the differences in power dynamics the difference in resources the difference in organisations uh, ability to to be part of this process um, so it's, it's about understanding your position but it's also about understanding the position of the the people that you're working with and that could be a long term process so I I would say that this going into this space is something which requires deep thinking it's not something which can be rushed so sometimes a new buzzword comes into being and people rush to try and implement something this collaborative working is based on these fundamental pr principles of trust and relationship and um, a, a horizontal distribution of power um, and to shift that culture takes a long time. So even if it takes six months or a year to get to the position where you're now ready to collaborate, that time needs to be invested. Thank you. That, that's a really great answer. I really appreciated that. I think um, sometimes when I read as the academic literature and some of the grey literature, I sometimes feel that power is not sufficiently um, brought forward and centred. That you know, there can be an overly optimistic, perhaps, idea as to that power can disappear almost in as we work collaboratively. And I, I really, I find it helpful. I'm sure people listening in will to think maybe one of the things you have to think about is the extent to which you actually surface that and you actively address it and you surface it with your potential partners and face it out or whether you try to work around it um yeah i just think it's so very important can i keep it of course you can come back Sophie. yeah yeah i was just going to oh. add um to that um something which I learned um, uh, when I was at university last year, and it's a phrase which I um, really encourage everybody to learn this phrase and to repeat it often, especially if you're a charity working with a funder. Um, and that phrase is coercive isomorphism. So I'll say it again, coercive isomorphism. And essentially what that means for, uh, within the voluntary sector is that as funders, we have coerced the voluntary sector to fit a model which suits us. So as funders and foundations, we want an application form, we want you to specify your outcomes, we want you to demonstrate your income, we want you to go through these processes and this model that we have created. And now the voluntary sector has morphed itself into that shape to fit the model that we've created. Whereas really collaborative leadership is about removing that model and going back to basics and putting the power in the hand of the communities, recognizing the expertise there um, and working with those communities um, to co-create those solutions. Um, so power is fundamentally part of that. But, uh, you know, I always say to charities that when you feel that you are in a difficult situation with a funder or you're being perhaps influenced or pressurized to move into an area which you're not used to or a way of working which you think won't work, um, you know, you should say to your funder that I feel that I am being coercively um, morphed into a model which suits you. Firstly, they won't really understand what you're saying. <laughs> but secondly, it gives them some food for thought. <laughs> Thank you again, Fozzi. It's really good to hear that um, sort of uh, re-emphasis on, on isomorphism. It's a, it's, a, it's a term that academics use quite a lot, um, perhaps doesn't often get used in the, in the wider context. So it's really good to hear that. And, and, it, and it is an important concept for voluntary organisations in particular, understanding the way that c they can be uh, pushed around and, and forced into a certain formats by by funding pressures so that's that's really interesting to hear. we've got lots of questions from the audience which is really good to see and i'm going to try and get through a few of those 
And one in particular from Stephanie is, is following up um, something that, that Posey was just talking about a minute ago. Um, so the question is, um, can you give a few examples of how you feel you have recognized that kind of expertise in the community that you mentioned? That was a question from Stephanie in the audience. Um, I think com uh, community foundations are probably better at this than uh, charitable foundations. So if I could just explain how community foundations work. Community foundations were set up in America and Canada probably 100 or so years ago, but they're much younger uh, within the UK, um, normally about 15 to 20 years ago. Community foundations essentially are there to draw funds, bring funds into a particular place. So we're all place-based funders. And um, you know, the fact that we're called community foundations um, puts an onus on us to represent and in, uh, involve and embed the community in everything that we do. So for example, um, in many charitable foundations, uh, funding decisions are made by the trustees or by the executive, um, whereas we recognize that it is the people living in those communities who have the expertise. So uh, our uh, funding decisions are made by community panels. So no trustees are involved in that decision. The executive advise, but again, we don't have the power of, of that decision-making process. Um, and I think that what that hopefully um, lends itself is it creates a culture of trust and relation of, of trust and builds a relationship between the community because quite often collaborative leadership is not just about stepping up but it's about stepping away or stepping back um, and recognizing where your expertise is limited so in this situation for example uh, the majority of community foundations leave it to the communities to make those funding decisions um, and, and, and that's the process which is now becoming quite um, trendy in the foundation sector. So a lot of charitable foundations are not now following that. Um, but I would say that that's one example um, where we recognize expertise and we recognize when we need to step back. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and a question that's come through from a few people, I think, in, in various different ways. Um, but, but in particular, Dave Cliff has posed a question. Um, about the, the combined local and national picture. So the question to Fosia is, based on your combined local and national connections, how do you think the needs in your local area compared to the national picture? And I guess, I guess flowing from that is, is, is how do you kind of keep that, that channel open between the interplay between the local and the, the national? That's a really good question. Um, and it's something that I'm constantly balancing. Um, I think I'm in an unusual position because most funders either work nationally or they work locally. Um, I'm unusual in that um, I'm on the board of ACF, which is the Association of Charitable Foundations. It's the membership body for national foundations. But operationally, I work very much in a, in a place-based way. And um, my opinion is that place-based funding is really the most effective way of funding. So um, there are very few um, people or organizations who are place-based but also national. But what I have found um, is that there is a lot of commonality in terms of the issues that we're dealing with. So um, I was recently involved in uh, an inclusive growth commission which was looking at growth in Luton, um, but on the, the flip side also looking at poverty and inequality. Um, at the same time, uh, as part, uh, with ACF, I'm looking at poverty and inequality at a national level, and you have great organizations like uh, the Joseph Browntree Foundation who are redefining the narrative about poverty, um, all, you know, amazing national research, um, which we could never hope to replicate at a local level um, in, in, and in terms of their try them trying to reframe the narrative. So it's about taking what is available nationally and trying to apply bits of that locally. So poverty and equality is a huge, you know, not the most pressing issue of our, of our time nationally, but also locally as well. So I think there is a reflection of what happens nationally and what happens locally, which makes it slightly easier to bridge that gap. Um, the difficulty can be when, uh, when people have perceptions of place that's when I think there, there's a role 
uh, for other community foundations to bridge the, the gap between national and local because a lot of national fun funders, for example, are very um, misguided perceptions about Luton, about Bedfordshire, um, and you know, uh, and uh, as a local place-based funder, I would say probably 50% of my time when I speak to national funders is is trying to uh, correct those misconceptions. Um, so that that's where our role is, but it's it's a constant balancing act. Thank you. I also have a question from Hannah, um, and she, firstly, she says. Thank you for a really interesting presentation, which we, we certainly all agree with. Um, she, she asks, have you done any work with public private sectors, sorry, public and private sectors, or one or the other, to engage them in collaborative leadership model, and how did this work? And I think this is a really important question. It comes up time and time again. How does such and such a sector work better with such and such a sector? But obviously, the private sector is, is often in the frame when we, when we talk about that. Um, so have you got some reflections on collaborating with and across and, uh, and in, in perhaps in complex ways with the private sector? Um, I would say we're still at early stages of this. Um, there are some community foundations who, who are probably way ahead of us in this. In terms of uh, working with the public sector, community foundations have uh, traditionally had quite strong relationships with the public sector. Um, as a community foundation, we're working at the moment very closely uh, with health authorities. Um, so um, we've just joined the Health Transformation Board. We're part of the Building Healthier Partnerships um, project. Um, and I literally had a meeting with them yesterday um, and we were talking about exactly the same thing that we're talking today about collaborative leadership. That the, the conversation there was focused on the health sector and the fact that um, working within the health sector, you work within a culture which has its own precedents, its policies, its processes, its terminology. Um, you know, when I first went to my first few health uh, board meetings, I really didn't understand a lot of what was being said because of the terminology. They're talking about mortality rates and this and that. Um, and as a, as a complete outsider to that world, um, you know, I, I really struggled. But at the same time, my day-to-day -day work is working with communities. So we fund a lot of health and well-being clubs. We fund, we fund dementia clubs. We fund sports clubs. Um, we fund counselling services. So a lot of, you know, a large part of my work on a day-to-day -day basis is working within the health arena. Um, so the, the building health the partnerships that I'm part of now is actually about collaborating better with the health sector. And I think recently a lot of work that the King's Fund has done and the Health Foundation has done about working um, much more closely with the voluntary sector um, has changed um, people's perceptions of, the, of the, the divide between the two. There is still a divide, but I think there is, there are, there is an intentionality in terms of uh, recognising that the two need to work much more closely together. Um, there are other uh, places in the UK where, where that is already taking place. In Bedfordshire, we're still at the beginning of, of, of that process. Um, the other uh, question was about um, private sector, <laughs> almost the government. The private sector, that's interesting. Um, normally when you work with the private sector, um, and a lot of community foundations rely on the private sector for funding. Um, so we're talking about, um, you know, uh, industries or factories or companies who are working in a particular area, for example, Bedfordshire, then giving back into that community, then contributing to that community um, with some sort of social value. What I have found is that um, I would say that there's a large gap between the private sector and the voluntary sector. The, uh, the, the relationship at the moment is very much based on a CSR strategy, which is a corporate social responsibility strategy. Um, and most CSR strategies are focused on marketing and uh, the ultimate aim is to present a good picture of the corporate rather than working for the benefit of the community. So that's a completely different framework that you're working in. So the, the, the majority of charities who have good relationships with uh, the corporate sector are very high profile, very tech savvy, you know, sort of um, 
media friendly charities who can connect with these corporates and can give them great case studies and pictures, etc, which they can then use as part of their CSR strategy. If you're looking at the really uh, most difficult projects, interventionist projects working on the most difficult areas of multiple needs, things like addiction, homelessness, um, domestic abuse, uh, if you've ever worked in those charities and tried to get a corporate sponsor, I would be very surprised. Um, you know, that fit just isn't, isn't there. So I would say that there is a relationship yet to be built and greater understanding um, needed on behalf of corporates as to what the charity sector does and how they can build a much more uh, meaningful relationship and, should I say, possibly less selfish relationship. Thank you. Again, that's a really interesting topic that could be opened up in a lot of different directions, I think. So the sense that um, partnering with charities can be done um, partly, partly for kind of image purposes or for the warm glow that might be associated with charity, perhaps a, a topic for another day, certainly one we could, we could dig into a, lo a lot more. I, I have a question, if, if I may, um, and it's, I guess, something you, you very briefly alluded to, and that's, I think, the kind of almost the flip side of collaboration, the sense that sometimes actually what people are doing a lot of the time is, is not collaborating and there's a very sort of positive spin often put on collaboration. Um, actually, in our day-to-day -day work, we meet people who, who aren't collaborative. So, so if I can ask you, how, how in, in, in a nutshell, um, or almost in a kind of a quick elevator pitch way, how do you encourage people or, or actually nudge people to become more collaborative? What, what is the killer hook? to encourage people to be collaborative, in, particularly in a voluntary sector context, I, I guess. Um, in my experience, nobody working in the voluntary sector is doing it for the money. There is some greater motivation, there is some sense of public good, public benefit of uh, a higher purpose which lies at, um, at the foundation of why people work in charities and why charities do what they do. Um, and I found that, um, you know, whether I'm working with charities or with local authorities, the, the, the message that's worked most effectively for me is about how the communities will benefit if we do X, Y, or Z. So with the Funders Day, you know, the three local authorities are not known for <laughs> collaborating, um, you know, and the fact that all three of them uh, collaborated on this day was because I was able to convince them that actually for the betterment of the community as a whole, for Bedfordshire as a whole, it was worth them taking part in this. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, finances, resources, etc., that can all play a part. But fundamentally, I do believe that um, charities um, greater purpose in terms of ser serving communities is the thing that has worked for me in terms of trying to convince them and motivate them. So even with the Small Charities Forum, um, you know, before a lot of the charities came to the Small Charities Forum, they would probably see themselves as in competition with each other. There were a few of those charities that we funded who did very similar work. Um, but actually put it, giving them a safe space to talk um, in a place where we're not um, forcing them to compete with each other, but to actually build a, a relationship. It comes back to our role as a convener in building that safe space and saying, you know, this isn't about competition. Um, so we also encourage um, uh, people to collaborate and apply for funding as a consortium. So we have elderly wellbeing groups and we used to receive seven applications from seven different groups every year. And working with the local authority, we worked with those groups um, and facilitated for them to come together. Um, you know, we paid, uh, we made a grant available for a facilitator, etc. So we we um, resourced that collaboration, and that collaboration now has gone on to uh, register itself as a as a charity and set up its own consortium and apply for funding separately, etc. Um, so it's about facilitating and providing that safe space and appealing to people's um, better motivation. Thank you again.
I'm just looking around the room to see if there are any further questions from the rest of our panel. So um, we have Carol still with us. Uh, we, I should say that we also have Fidel with us. So Fidel is a visiting fellow at the Centre for Respect for Leadership. He's not actually managed to get mic'd up today, so he's not he's not been playing an active part, but he is here and he's been helping with, with taking questions from the audience. But I just wondered if, if he had a specific question for Fosia. And if so, now is your time. Um, I, I have a question, um, but uh, it actually emanates from what is coming through the system, which is to do with uh, when we are talking about uh, collaborative leadership, we are assuming everybody's power is equal. And uh, a few people have raised the issue of those hard to reach groups. So the question is, how do you leverage power differential in a co collaborative leadership initiative? Uh, because if you, you know, we have spoken about private sector, public sector, they are all very powerful. And they use the jargon, they use some sort of, uh, sort of language which is not accessible. So how can we go about enabling hard rich groups to engage in a collaborative leadership initiative? Thank you. Um, I think this comes back to um, the approach which I advocate, which is the equity approach, because I I, I struggle with the, the term hard to reach communities. Um, I think communities are communities, and uh, if there's a problem reaching communities, it's a problem with you, <laughs> not with the community. Mm -hmm. So um, I prefer, and I think that emphasis that action that term actually emphasizes um you know what this what this conversation is all about is that we're assuming communities are hard to reach actually what that indicates is that we haven't had the right approach and we haven't reached those communities so we need to change what we're doing um so the equity approach which i was talking about is about recognizing different communities and different outcomes so, for example, in um, uh, the Greater Buffalo Community Foundation, where I, uh, which I visited for a few days, they have a racial equity roundtable where um, they uh, focus a lot on data. Um, and from that data, they realise that, for example, young black men were disproportionately higher represented in, um, in jails in the criminal justice system. Um, and so they then uh, put into place a program which was specifically for young black men. Uh, with other communities, there were other issues. So that equity approach is about recognizing the particular issues which are occurring with different communities. And that may be issues in terms of reaching them. It may be that, um, you know, you know, if you if you do a, a survey of who are, all our grant making goes to, you may realise that actually the LGBT community is only one percent of our total grant making. So why are they not applying to funding for funding from us? So then you put into you investigate what are the obstacles, what are the barriers, why are they not coming forth, and is that something to do with what we have set up? So it's it's almost a reverse. You're you're not expecting the community to come. To you, you're investigating and understanding and reflecting on, on what you need to do in order to reach that community. A simple answer. <laughs> simple answer. <laughs> Thank you. That is re that's a really powerful message to, to finish on, I think. Carol, do you have anything to add just, just very briefly? I know we're getting close to the end of time now. I, I suppose I just want to add that there, there is in the literature also a bit of a warning about romanticising collaborative leadership, just as the same as we can uh, look to leadership and to leaders, individual leaders, to kind of save us to resolve big issues. The danger is that we, we put the adjective of collaborative in front of leadership and suddenly this is an idea that is going to resolve everything. So I suppose that it, I would just want to add um, a warning that the literature does tell us, um, unsurprisingly, that when we're collaborating, relationships can become too cosy, manipulative, they can exclude people rather than including people, and that, that we need to look out for that kind of danger, I think, when we're putting some of these ideas into practice. I don't know if Fosia would agree with that. Definitely, and that, that comes back to my point about being self-aware. Um, that, that's the key to all of this, really. <laughs>
Thank you, Fosia. I just want to um, say again, thank you so much to Fosia for joining us. I know she's come not too far today over from, is it from Luton that you came over from today? Yeah. So, so not a million miles away from Milton Keynes, but we really appreciate you coming over and, and spending the time. Um, it's made, it's made a, a, I think, I think um, hopefully everyone in the audience will agree it's been a really interesting session. Uh, it's raised you know, more questions and, and lots of thoughts that we will seek to develop. Uh, on that note, I think uh, CVSL will continue to be doing webinars in the future. Um, we'd be really open to ideas from the audience, from from anyone who might have heard this webinar, about other people we, we could invite to speak to us, uh, whether on the themes of leadership, collaboration, voluntary sector in general. It, it would be really good to make this a, a regular thing that we do. And um, we, cer we certainly have an, every intention of doing that. So, so do let us know if you um, if, if you've got any ideas, or or indeed would like to nominate yourself to to come and speak to us. Um, so I've thanked Fosia. I'd like to thank Carol as well for her intervention, and also Fidel for helping today and uh, posing his own question and and. Uh, making sure that we took, took account of all the questions from the audience. Uh, finally, I'd really like to thank uh, Lucy and Alice who've uh, helped us with all the technicalities behind the scenes today with the webinar. We've probably had a few uh, technical quibbles, but it worked really well, I hope, and I hope the audience appreciated it as well. So uh, thank you again for joining us on such a hot day. Uh, we're, we're in a rather airless room in the uh, business school. Luckily, we've had a fan keeping us relatively cool, but it's, it's really great that you've been able to join us on this, this scorching day. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the day.